The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book Three, Chapter Two A Bird's Eye View of Paris. We have just attempted to restore, for the reader's benefit, that admirable church of Notre Dame de Paris. We have briefly pointed out the greater part of the beauties which it possessed in the fifteenth century, and which it lacks today. But we have omitted the principal thing the view of Paris which was then to be obtained from the summits of its towers. That was, in fact, when, after having long groped one's way up the dark spiral which perpendicularly pierces the thick wall of the belfries, one emerged, at last abruptly, upon one of the lofty platforms inundated with light and air. That was, in fact, a fine picture which spread out on all sides at once before the eye a spectacle, sui generis, of which those of our readers who have had the good fortune to see a Gothic city entire, complete, homogeneous, a few of which still remain, Nuremberg in Bavaria and Victoria in Spain, can readily form an idea, or even smaller specimens, provided that they are well preserved, Vitre in Brittany, Nordhausen in Prussia. The Paris of three hundred and fifty years ago, the Paris of the fifteenth century was already a gigantic city. We Parisians generally make a mistake as to the ground which we think that we have gained, since Paris has not increased much over one-third since the time of Louis the Eleventh. It has certainly lost more in beauty than it has gained in size. Paris had its birth, as the reader knows, in that old island of the city which has the form of a cradle. The strand of that island was its first boundary wall, the Seine its first moat. Paris remained for many centuries in its island state, with two bridges, one on the north, the other on the south, and two bridgeheads, which were at the same time its gates and its fortresses, the Grand Châtelet on the right bank, the Petit Châtelet on the left. Then, from the date of the kings of the first race, Paris, being too cribbed and confined in its island, and unable to return thither, crossed the water. Then, beyond the Grand, beyond the Petit Châtelet, a first circle of walls and towers began to infringe upon the country on the two sides of the Seine. Some vestiges of this ancient enclosure still remain in the last century. Today, only the memory of it is left, and here and there a tradition, the Baudets or Baudayer Gate, Port Bagoda. Little by little, the tide of houses, always thrust from the center of the city outwards, overflows, devours, wears away, and defaces this wall. Philippe Augustus makes a new dike for it. He imprisons Paris in a circular chain of great towers, both lofty and solid. For the period of more than a century, the houses press upon each other, accumulate and raise their level in this basin, like water in a reservoir. They begin to deepen. They pile story upon story. They mount upon each other. They gush forth at the top, like all laterally compressed growth, and there is a rivalry as to which shall thrust its head above its neighbors for the sake of getting a little air. The street glows narrower and deeper. Every space is overwhelmed and disappears. The houses finally leap the wall of Philippe Augustus and scatter joyfully over the plain, without order and all askew, like runaways. They plant themselves squarely, cut themselves gardens from the fields, and take their ease. Beginning with 1367, the city spreads to such an extent into the suburbs that a new wall becomes necessary, particularly on the right bank. Charles V builds it. But a city like Paris is perpetually growing. It is only such cities that become capitals. They are funnels, into which all the geographical, political, moral, and intellectual watersheds of a country, all the natural slopes of a people, pour. Wells of civilization, so to speak, and also sewers, where commerce, industry, intelligence, population, all that is sap, all that is life, all that is the soul of a nation, filters and amasses unceasingly, drop by drop, century by century. 
So Charles V's wall suffered the fate of that of Philip Augustus. At the end of the fifteenth century, the Faubourg strides across it, passes beyond it, and runs farther. In the sixteenth, it seems to retreat visibly, and to bury itself deeper and deeper in the old city, so thick had the new city already become outside of it. Thus, beginning with the fifteenth century, where our story finds us, Paris had already outgrown the three concentric circles of walls, which, from the time of Julian the Apostate, existed, so to speak, in germ in the Grand Châtelet and the Petit Châtelet. The mighty city had cracked in succession its four enclosures of walls, like a child grown too large for his garments of last year. Under Louis XI, this sea of houses was seen to be pierced at intervals by several groups of ruined towers from the ancient wall, like the summits of hills in an inundation, like archipelagos of the old Paris submerged beneath the new. Since that time, Paris has undergone yet another transformation, unfortunately for our eyes, but it has passed only one more wall, that of Louis the Fifteenth, that miserable wall of mud and spittle, worthy of the king who built it, worthy of the poet who sung it, Le mur mirant Paris rant Paris murmurant. The wall walling Paris makes Paris murmur. In the fifteenth century, Paris was still divided into three wholly distinct and separate towns, each having its own physiognomy, its own specialty, its manners, customs, privileges, and history. The city, the university, the town. The city, which occupied the island, was the most ancient, the smallest, and the mother of the other two, crowded in between them like, may we be pardoned the comparison, a little old woman between two large and handsome maidens. The university covered the left bank of the Seine, from the Tournelle to the Tour de Nesle, points which correspond in the Paris of today, the one to the wine market, the other to the mint. Its wall included a large part of that plain where Julian had built his hot baths. The hill of saint Genevieve was enclosed in it. The culminating point of this sweep of walls was the Papal Gate, that is to say, near the present site of the Pantheon. The town, which was the largest of the three fragments of Paris, held the right bank. Its quay, broken or interrupted in many places, ran along the Seine, from the Tour de Belly to the Tour de Bois, that is to say, from the place where the granary stands today to the present site of the Tuileries. These four points, where the Seine intersected the wall of the capital, the Tournelle and the Tour de Nesle on the right, and the Tour de Belly and the Tour de Bois on the left, were called preeminently the Four Towers of Paris. The town encroached still more extensively upon the fields than the university. The culminating point of the town wall, that of Charles V, was at the gates of Saint-Denis and Saint-Martin, whose situation has not been changed. As we have just said, each of these three great divisions of Paris was a town, but too special a town to be complete, a city which could not get along with the other two. Hence three entirely distinct aspects. Churches abounded in the city, palaces in the town, and colleges in the university. Neglecting here the originalities, of secondary importance in old Paris, and the capricious regulations regarding the public highways, we will say, from a general point of view, taking only masses and the whole group, in this chaos of communal jurisdictions, that the island belonged to the bishop, the right bank to the provost of the merchants, the left bank to the rector. Over all ruled the provost of Paris, a royal, not a municipal office. The city had Notre Dame, the town the Louvre, and the Hôtel de Ville the university, the Sorbonne. The town had the markets, the city, the hospital, the university, the pré aux clair Offenses committed by the scholars on the left bank were tried in the law courts on the island, and were punished on the right bank at Montfaucon, unless the rector, feeling the university to be strong and the king weak, intervened, for it was the student's privilege to be hanged on their own grounds. The greater part of these privileges, it may be noted in passing, 
and there were some even better than the above, had been extorted from the kings by revolts and mutinies. It is the course of things from time immemorial. The king only lets go when the people tear away. There is an old charter which puts the matter naively. Apropos of fidelity. Civibus fidelitas in reges, quo e tamen ale quotias, sediti onibus, interrupta multa peperit privilegia. In the fifteenth century the Seine bathed five islands within the walls of Paris. Louvier Island, where there were then trees, and where there is no longer anything but wood, Le Isle aux Vaches and Le Isle Notre Dame, both deserted, with the exception of one house, both fiefs of the bishop. In the seventeenth century a single island was formed out of these two, which was built upon and named L'Ile Saint Louis. Lastly, the city, and at its point, the little islet of the cow tender, which was afterwards engulfed beneath the platform of the Pont Neuf. The city then had five bridges three on the right, the Pont Notre Dame and the Pont au Change of stone, the Pont au Monnier of wood, two on the left, the Petit Pont of stone and the Pont Saint Michel of wood, all loaded with houses. The university had six gates, built by Philippe Augustus. There were, beginning with La Tournelle, the Port Saint-Victor, the Port Bordel, the Port Papal, the Port Saint-Jacques, the Port Saint-Michel, the Port Saint-Germain. The town had six gates, built by Charles V. Beginning with the Tour de Belly, they were the Port Saint-Antoine, the Port du Temple, the Port Saint-Martin, the Port Saint-Denis, the Port Montmartre, the Port Saint-Honoré. All these gates were strong and also handsome, which does not detract from strength. A large deep moat, with a brisk current during the high water of winter, bathed the base of the walled round Paris. The Seine furnished the water. At night the gates were shut, the river was barred at both ends of the city with huge iron chains, and Paris slept tranquilly. From a bird's-eye view, these three burgs, the city, the town, and the university, each presented to the eye an inextricable skein of eccentrically tangled streets. Nevertheless, at first sight, one recognized the fact that these three fragments formed but one body. One immediately perceived three long parallel streets, unbroken, undisturbed, traversing, almost in a straight line, all three cities from one end to the other, from north to south, perpendicularly to the Seine, which bound them together, mingled them, infused them in each other, poured and transfused the people incessantly from one to the other, and made one out of the three. The first of these streets ran from the Port Saint-Martin. It was called the Rue Saint-Jacques in the university, Rue de la Jouverie in the city, Rue Saint-Martin in the town. It crossed the water twice, under the name of the Petit Pont and the Pont Notre-Dame. The second, which was called the Rue de la Harpe on the left bank, Rue de la Barillerie on the island, Rue Saint-Denis on the right bank, Pont Saint-Michel on one arm of the Seine, Pont au Change on the other, ran from the Port Saint-Michel in the university to the Port Saint-Denis in the town. However, under all these names there were but two streets parent streets, generating streets, the two arteries of Paris. All the other veins of the triple city either derived their supply from them or emptied into them. Independently of these two principal streets, piercing Paris diametrically in its whole breadth from side to side, common to the entire capital, the city and the university had also each its own great special street, which ran lengthwise by them parallel to the Seine, cutting, as it passed, at right angles, the two arterial thoroughfares. Thus in the town one descended in a straight line from the Port Saint-Antoine to the Port Saint-Honoré, in the university from the Port Saint-Victor to the Port Saint-Germain. These two great thoroughfares intersected by the two first formed the canvas upon which reposed, nodded and crowded together on every hand, the labyrinthine network of the streets of Paris. 
in the incomprehensible plan of these streets, one distinguished likewise, on looking attentively, two clusters of great streets, like magnified sheaves of grain, one in the university, the other in the town, which spread out gradually from the bridges to the gates. Some traces of this geometrical plan still exist today. Now, what aspect did this whole present when, as viewed from the summit of the towers of Notre Dame in 1482, that we shall try to describe? For the spectator who arrived panting upon that pinnacle, it was first a dazzling, confusing view of roofs, chimneys, streets, bridges, places, spires, bell towers. Everything struck your eye at once the carved gable, the pointed roof the turrets suspended at the angles of the walls, the stone pyramids of the eleventh century, the slate obelisks of the fifteenth, the round bare tower of the donjon keep, the square and fretted tower of the church, the great and the little, the massive and the aerial. The eye was, for a long time, wholly lost in this labyrinth, where there was nothing which did not possess its originality, its reason, its genius, its beauty nothing which did not proceed from art. Beginning with the smallest house, with its painted and carved front, with external beams, elliptical door, with projecting stories, to the Royal Louvre, which then had a colonnade of towers. But these are the principal masses which were then to be distinguished when the eye began to accustom itself to this tumult of edifices. In the first place, the city. The island of the city, as Sauval says, who, in spite of his confused medley, sometimes has such happy turns of expression. The island of the city is made like a great ship, stuck in the mud and run aground in the current near the center of the Seine. We have just explained that, in the fifteenth century, this ship was anchored to the two banks of the river by five bridges. This form of a ship had also struck the heraldic scribes. For it is from that, and not from the siege by the Normans, that the ship which blazons the old shield of Paris comes, according to Favenne and Pasquier. For him who understands how to decipher them, armorial bearings are algebra, armorial bearings have a tongue. The whole history of the second half of the Middle Ages is written in armorial bearings. The first half is in the symbolism of the Roman churches. They are the hieroglyphics of feudalism, succeeding those of theocracy. Thus the city first presented itself to the eye, with its stern to the east and its prow to the west. Turning towards the prow, one had before one an innumerable flock of ancient roofs, over which arched broadly the lead-covered apse of the Saint-Chapelle like an elephant's haunches loaded with its tower. Only here, this tower was the most audacious, the most open, the most ornamented spire of cabinet-maker's work that ever let the sky peep through its cone of lace. In front of Notre Dame, and very near at hand, three streets opened into the cathedral square, a fine square lined with ancient houses. Over the south side of this place bent the wrinkled and sullen façade of the Hôtel Dieu, and its roof which seemed covered with warts and pustules. Then, on the right and the left, to the east and west, within that wall of the city, which was yet so contracted, rose the bell-towers of its one-and-twenty churches, of every date, of every form, of every size, from the low and worm-eaten belfry of the Saint-Denis-du-Pas, to the slender needles of saint pierre aux Boeufs and saint Landry. Behind Notre-Dame the cloister and its Gothic gallery spread out towards the north, on the south the half-Roman palace of the bishop, on the east the desert point of the terrain. In this throng of houses the eye also distinguished, by the lofty open-work mitres of stone which then crowned the roof itself, even the most elevated windows of the palace the hotel given by the city under Charles the Sixth to Juvenal de Ursin, a little farther on the pitched covered sheds of the Palace Market. In still another quarter the new apse of the Saint Germain la Vieux, lengthened in fourteen fifty eight with a bit of the Rue aux Fab, and then in places a square crowded with people, 
a pillory erected at the corner of a street, a fine fragment of the pavement of Philippe Augustus, a magnificent flagging, grooved for the horse's feet in the middle of the road, and so badly replaced in the sixteenth century by the miserable cobblestones called the pavement of the league, a deserted back courtyard, with one of those diaphanous staircase turrets, such as were erected in the fifteenth century, one of which is still to be seen in the Rue de Bourdonnais. Lastly, at the right of the Saint-Chapelle towards the west, the Palace de Justice, rested its group of towers at the edge of the water. The thickets of the King's Gardens, which covered the western point of the city, masked the island de Passeur. As for the water, from the summit of the towers of Notre-Dame one hardly saw it, on either side of the city. The Seine was hidden by bridges, the bridges by houses. And when the glance passed these bridges, whose roofs were visibly green, rendered mouldy before their time by the vapours of the water, if it was directed to the left, towards the university, the first edifice which struck it was a large, low sheaf of towers, the Petit Châtelet, whose yawning gate devoured the end of the Petit Pont. Then, if your view ran along the bank from east to west, from the Tournelle to the Tour de Nesle, there was a long cordon of houses, with carved beams, stained glass windows, each story projecting over that beneath it, an interminable zigzag of bourgeois gables, frequently interrupted by the mouth of a street, and from time to time also by the front or angle of a huge stone mansion, planted at its ease with courts and gardens, wings and detached buildings, amid this populace of crowded and narrow houses, like a grand gentleman among a throng of rustics. There were five or six of these mansions on the quay, from the house of Lorraine, which shared with the Bernardins the grand enclosure adjoining the Tournelle to the Hôtel de Nesle, whose principal tower ended Paris, and whose pointed roofs were in a position during three months of the year to encroach, with their black triangles, upon the scarlet disk of the setting sun. This side of the Seine was, however, the last mercantile of the two. Students furnished more of a crowd and more noise there than artisans, and there was not, properly speaking, any key except from the Pont Saint-Michel to the Tour de Nesle. The rest of the bank of the Seine was now a naked strand, the same as beyond the Bernardin. Again a throng of houses, standing with their feet in the water, as between the two bridges. There was a great uproar of laundresses. They screamed and talked and sang from morning till night along the beach, and beat a great deal of linen there, just as in our day. This is not the least of the gaieties of Paris. The university presented a dense mass to the eye. From one end to the other it was homogeneous and compact. The thousand roofs, dense, angular, clinging to each other, composed nearly all of the same geometrical element, offered, when viewed from above, the aspect of a crystallization of the same substance. The capricious ravine of streets did not cut this block of houses into two disproportionate slices. The forty-two colleges were scattered about in a fairly equal manner, and there were some everywhere. The amusingly varied crests of these beautiful edifices were the product of the same art as the simple roofs which they overshot, and were actually only a multiplication of the square or the cube of the same geometrical figure. Hence they complicated the whole effect without disturbing it, completed without overloading it. Geometry is harmony. Some fine mansions here and there made magnificent outlines against the picturesque attics of the left bank. The house of Nevers, the house of Rome, the house of Rheims, which have disappeared. The Hôtel du Cluny, which still exists, for the consolation of the artist, and whose tower was so stupidly deprived of its crown a few years ago. Close to Cluny, that Roman palace, with fine round arches, were once the hot baths of Julian. There were a great many abbeys, of a beauty more devout, of a grandeur more solemn than the mansions, but not less beautiful, not less grand. Those which first caught the eye were the Bernandins, with their three bell-towers, Saint-Jean-Viave, 
whose square tower, which still exists, makes us regret the rest. The Sorbonne, half college, half monastery, of which so admirable a nave survives. The fine quadrilateral cloister of the Maturin, its neighbor, the cloister of Saint-Benoît, within whose walls they have had time to cobble up a theatre, between the seventh and eighth editions of this book. The Cordelier, with their three enormous adjacent gables. The Augustin, whose graceful spire formed, after the Tour de Nesle, the second denticulation of this side of Paris, starting from the west. The colleges, which are in fact the intermediate ring between the cloister and the world, hold the middle position in the monumental series between the hotel and the abbeys, with a severity full of elegance, sculpture less giddy than the palaces, and architecture less severe than the convents. Unfortunately, hardly anything remains of these monuments, where Gothic art combined with so just a balance, richness, and economy. The churches, and they were numerous and splendid in the university, and they were graded there also in all the ages of architecture, from the round arches of Saint Julien to the pointed arches of Saint Severin. The churches dominated the whole. And, like one harmony more in this mass of harmonies, they pierced in quick succession the multiple open work of the gables with slashed spires, with open work bell towers with slender pinnacles whose line was also only a magnificent exaggeration of the acute angle of the roofs. The ground of the university was hilly. Mount saint javia formed an enormous mound to the south, and it was a sight to see from the summit of Notre-Dame how that throng of narrow and tortuous streets, today the Latin Quarter, whose bunches of houses, which spread out in every direction from the top of this eminence, precipitated themselves in disorder, and almost perpendicularly down its flanks, nearly to the water's edge, having the air, some of falling, others of clambering up again, and all of holding to one another. A continual flux of a thousand black points, which passed each other on the pavements, made everything move before the eyes. It was the populace seen thus from aloft and afar. Lastly, in the intervals of these roofs, of these spires, of these accidents of numberless edifices, which bent and writhed and jagged in so eccentric a manner the extreme line of the university, one caught a glimpse, here and there, of a great expanse of moss-grown wall, a thick round tower, a crenellated city gate, shadowing forth the fortress. It was the wall of Philippe Augustus. Beyond, the fields gleamed green. Beyond fled the roads, along which were scattered a few more suburban houses, which became more infrequent as they became more distant. Some of these faubourgs were important. There were, first, starting from La Tournelle, the Bourg Saint-Victor, with its one arch-bridge over the Bièvre, its abbey where one could read the epitaph of Louis Le Gros, Epitaphium Ludovici Grossi, and its church with an octagonal spire, flanked with four little bell-towers of the eleventh century. A similar one can be seen at Etampe. It is not yet destroyed. Next, the Bourg Saint-Marceau, which already had three churches and one convent. Then, leaving the mill of the Gobelins and its four white walls on the left, there was the Faubourg Saint-Jacques, with the beautiful carved cross in its square. The church of Saint-Jacques du Hopa, which was then Gothic, pointed, charming. saint Marois, a fine nave of the fourteenth century, which Napoleon turned into a hayloft. Notre-Dame-de-Champs, where there were Byzantine mosaics. Lastly, after having left behind, full in the country, the monastery de Chartreux, a rich edifice contemporary with the Palais de Justice, with its little garden divided into compartments, and the haunted ruins of Vauvert, the eye fell to the west upon the three Roman spires of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. The Bourg Saint-Germain, already a large community, formed fifteen or twenty streets in the rear. The pointed bell of Saint-Sulpice marked one corner of the town. Close beside it one described the quadrilateral enclosure of the fair of Saint-Germain, 
where the market is situated today. Then the abbot's pillory, a pretty little round tower, well capped with a leaden cone. The brickyard was further on, and the rue de four, which led to the common bakehouse, and the mill on its hillock, and the lazar house, a tiny house, isolated and half seen. But that which attracted the eye most of all, and fixed it for a long time on that point, was the abbey itself. It is certain that this monastery, which had a grand air, both as a church and as a seigneury, that abbatial palace where the bishops of Paris counted themselves happy if they could pass the night, that refectory upon which the architect had bestowed the air, the beauty, and the rose window of a cathedral, that elegant chapel of the Virgin, that monumental dormitory, those vast gardens, that portcullis, that drawbridge, that envelope of battlements which notched to the eye the verdure of the surrounding meadows, those courtyards where gleamed men-at-arms intermingled with golden copes. The whole grouped and clustered about three lofty spires with round arches, well planted upon a Gothic apse, made a magnificent figure against the horizon. When, at length, after having contemplated the university for a long time, you turned towards the right bank, towards the town, the character of the spectacle was abruptly altered. The town, in fact much larger than the university, was also less of a unit. At the first glance one saw that it was divided into many masses, singularly distinct. First, to the eastward, in that part of the town which still takes its name from the marsh where the Camulogenet entangled Caesar, was a pile of palaces. The block extended to the very water's edge. Four almost contiguous hôtels, Jouet, Sans, Barbeau, the House of the Queen, mirrored their slate peaks, broken their slender turrets in the same. These four edifices filled the space from the Rue de Nonandières to the Abbey of the Celestins, whose spire gracefully relieved their line of gables and battlements. A few miserable greenish hovels, hanging over the water in front of the sumptuous hotel, did not prevent one from seeing the fine angles of their façades, their large square windows with stone mullions, their pointed porches overloaded with statues, the vivid outlines of their walls, always clear-cut, and all those charming accidents of architecture which cause Gothic art to have the air of beginning in its combinations afresh with every monument. Behind these palaces, extended in all directions, now broken, fenced in, battlemented like a citadel, now veiled by great trees like a Carthusian convent, the immense and multiform enclosure of that miraculous Hôtel de Saint-Paul where the King of France possessed the means of lodging superbly two and twenty princes of the rank of the Dauphin and the Duke of Burgundy, with their domestics and their suites, without counting the great lords, and the Emperor when he came to view Paris, and the lions, who had their separate hotel at the Royal Hotel. Let us say here that a prince's apartment was then composed of never less than eleven large rooms, from the chamber of state to the oratory, not to mention the galleries, baths, vapor-baths, and other superfluous places, with which each apartment was provided, not to mention the private gardens for each of the king's guests, not to mention the kitchens, the cellars, the domestic offices, the general refectories of the house, the poultry-yards where there were twenty-two general laboratories, from the bakehouses to the wine-cellars games of a thousand sorts, malls, tennis, and riding at the ring, aviaries, fish-ponds, menageries, stables, barns, libraries, arsenals, and foundries. This was what a king's palace, a Louvre, a Hôtel de Saint-Paul was then, a city within a city. From the tower where we are placed, the Hôtel Saint-Paul, almost half hidden by the four great houses of which we have just spoken, was still very considerable and very marvellous to see. One could there distinguish, very well, though cleverly united with the principal building by long galleries, decked with painted glass and slender columns, 
the three hotel which Charles V had amalgamated with his palace. The hotel du Petit Musset, with the airy balustrade which formed a graceful border to its roof. The hotel of the Abbe de saint Mar, having the vanity of a stronghold, a great tower, machicolations, loopholes, iron gratings, and over the large Saxon door, the armorial bearings of the Abbe between the two mortises of the drawbridge. The hotel of the Comte de Tomp, whose dungeon keep, ruined at its summit, was rounded and notched like a coxcomb. Here and there, three or four ancient oaks, forming a tuft together like enormous cauliflowers. Gambles of swans in the clear water of the fish ponds, all in folds of light and shade. Many courtyards of which one beheld picturesque bits. The Hotel of the Lyon, with its low pointed arches on short Saxon pillars, its iron gratings and its perpetual roar. Shooting up above the hole, the scale ornamented spire of the Ave Maria. On the left, the house of the Provost of Paris, flanked by four small towers, delicately grooved in the middle. At the extremity, the Hotel St. Paul, properly speaking, with its multiplied facades, its successive enrichments from the time of Charles V, the hybrid excrescences with which the fancy of the architects had loaded it during the last two centuries with all the apses of its chapels, all the gables of its galleries, a thousand weathercocks for the four winds, and its two lofty contiguous towers, whose conical roof, surrounded by battlements at its base, looked like those pointed caps which have their edges turned up. Continuing to mount the stories of this amphitheatre of palaces spread out afar upon the ground, after crossing a deep ravine huddled out of the roofs in the town, which marked the passage of the Rue Saint-Antoine, the eye reached the house of Angoulême, a vast construction of many epochs, where there were perfectly new and very white parts, which melted no better into the hole than a red patch on a blue doublet. Nevertheless, the remarkably pointed and lofty roof of the modern palace, bristling with carved eaves, covered with sheets of lead, where coiled a thousand fantastic arabesques of sparkling incrustations of gilded bronze. That roof, so curiously damascened, darted upwards gracefully from the midst of the brown ruins of the ancient edifice, whose huge and ancient towers, rounded by age like casks, sinking together with old age, and rending themselves from top to bottom, resembled great bellies unbuttoned. Behind rose the forest of spires of the Palais de Tournelle. Not a view in the world, either at Chambord or at the Alhambra, is more magic, more aerial, more enchanting, than that thicket of spires, tiny bell-towers, chimneys, weather-vanes, winding staircases, lanterns through which the daylight makes its way, which seem to cut out at a blow pavilions, spindle-shaped turrets, or, as they were called then, tournelles, all differing in form, in height, and attitude. One would have pronounced it a gigantic stone chessboard. To the right of the tournelle, that truss of enormous towers, black as ink, running into each other and tied, as it were, by a circular moat. That dungeon keep, much more pierced with loopholes than with windows. That drawbridge, always raised that portcullis, always lowered, is the Bastille. Those sorts of black beaks which project from between the battlements, and which you take from a distance to be cave-spouts, are cannons. Beneath them, at the foot of the formidable edifice, behold the Porte Saint-Antoine buried between its two towers. Beyond the Tournelle, as far as the wall of Charles V, spread out, with rich compartments of verdure and of flowers, a velvet carpet of cultivated land and royal parks, in the midst of which one recognized by its labyrinth of trees and alleys the famous Daedalus garden which Louis XI had given to Quatier. The doctor's observatory rose above the labyrinth like a great isolated column, with a tiny house for a capital. Terrible astrologies took place in that laboratory. There today is the Place Royale. 
As we have just said, the quarter of the palace, of which we have just endeavored to give the reader some idea by indicating only the chief points, filled the angle which Charles V's wall made with the Seine on the east. The center of the town was occupied by a pile of houses for the populace. It was there, in fact, that the three bridges disgorged upon the right bank, and the bridges led to the building of houses rather than palaces. That congregation of bourgeois habitations, pressed together like cells in a hive, had a beauty of its own. It is with the roofs of a capital as with the waves of the sea. They are grand. First the streets, crossed and entangled, forming a hundred amusing figures in the block. Around the marketplace it was like a star with a thousand rays. The rues Saint-Denis and Saint-Martin, with their innumerable ramifications, rose one after the other, like trees intertwining their branches. And then the tortuous lines, the rues de la Platrerie, de la Verrerie, de la Tisserandery, etc., meandered over all. There were also fine edifices which pierced the petrified undulations of that sea of gables. At the head of the Pont aux Changeurs, behind which one beheld the Seine foaming beneath the wheels of the Pont aux Monniers, there was the Chalolet, no longer a Roman tower, as under Julian the Apostate, but a feudal tower of the thirteenth century, and of a stone so hard that the pickaxe could not break away so much as the thickness of the fist in a space of three hours. There was the rich square bell-tower of Saint-Jacques de la Boucherie, with its angles all frothing with carvings, already admirable, although it was not finished in the fifteenth century. It lacked, in particular, the four monsters, which, still perched today on the corners of its roof, have the air of so many sphinxes who are propounding to new Paris the riddle of the ancient Paris. Rayot, the sculptor, only placed them in position in 1526, and received twenty francs for his pains. There was the Maison aux Piliers, the pillar-house, opening upon the Place de Greve, of which we have given the reader some idea. There was Saint-Gervais, which a front, in good taste, has since spoiled. Sainte Marie, whose ancient pointed arches were still almost round arches. Saint Jean, whose magnificent spire was proverbial. There were twenty other monuments, which did not disdain to bury their wonders in that chaos of black, deep, narrow streets. Add the crosses of carved stone, more lavishly scattered through the squares than even the gibbets. The cemetery of the innocents, whose architectural wall could be seen in the distance above the roofs. The pillory of the markets, whose top was visible between two chimneys of the Rue de la Cossonnerie. The latter of the Croix du Trahois, in its square always black with people. The circular buildings of the Wheat Mart the fragments of Philippe Augustus's ancient wall, which could be made out here and there, drowned among the houses, its towers gnawed by ivy, its gates in ruins, with crumbling and deformed stretches of wall. The quay, with its thousand shops, and its bloody knacker's yards. The Seine, encumbered with boats, from the Porte à Foin to Port l'Evêque, and you will have a confused picture of what the central trapezium of the town was like in 1482. With these two quarters, one of hotel, the other of houses, the third feature of aspect presented by the city was a long zone of abbeys, which boarded it in nearly the whole of its circumference, from the rising to the setting sun, and behind the circle of fortifications which hemmed in Paris, formed a second interior enclosure of convents and chapels. Thus, immediately adjoining the Parc de Tournelle, between the Rue Saint-Etoine and the Vieille Rue de Temple, there stood St. Catherine, with its immense cultivated lands, which were terminated only by the wall of Paris. Between the old and the new Rue de Temple there was the Temple, a sinister group of towers, lofty, erect, and isolated in the middle of a vast battlement enclosure. 
Between the Rue Neuve de Temple and the Rue Saint-Martin there was the Abbey of Saint-Martin, in the midst of its gardens, a superb fortified church, whose girdle of towers, whose diadem of bell-towers, yielded in force and splendor only to Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Between the Rue Saint-Martin and the Rue Saint-Denis spread the enclosure of the Trinité. Lastly, between the Rue Saint-Denis and the Rue Montorgue stood the Filet Dieu. On one side, the rotting roofs and unpaved enclosure of the Cour de Miracle could be descried. It was the sole profane ring which was linked to that devout chain of convents. Finally, the fourth compartment, which stretched itself out in the agglomeration of the roofs on the right bank, and which occupied the western angle of the enclosure and the banks of the river downstream, was a fresh cluster of palaces and hotel pressed close about the base of the Louvre. This old Louvre of Philippe Augustus, that immense edifice whose great tower rallied about it three and twenty chief towers, not to reckon the lesser towers, seemed from a distance to be enshrined in the Gothic roofs of the Hôtel de Alençon and the Petit Bourbon. This hydra of towers, giant guardian of Paris, with its four-and-twenty heads, always erect, with its monstrous haunches, loaded or scaled with slates, and all streaming with metallic reflections, terminated with wonderful effect the configuration of the town towards the west. Thus an immense block, which the Romans called Iusula, or island, of bourgeois houses, flanked on the right and the left by two blocks of palaces, crowned, the one by the Louvre, the other by the Tournelle, bordered on the north by a long girdle of abbeys and cultivated enclosures, all amalgamated and melted together in one view. Upon these thousands of edifices, whose tiled and slated roofs outlined upon each other so many fantastic chains, the bell-towers, tattooed, fluted, and ornamented with twisted bands, of the four-and-forty churches on the right bank, myriads of cross-streets, for boundary on one side an enclosure of lofty walls with square towers, that of the university had round towers, on the other the same, cut by bridges, and bearing on its bosom a multitude of boats. Behold the town of Paris in the fifteenth century. Beyond the walls, several suburban villages pressed close about the gates, but less numerous and more scattered than those of the university. Behind the Bastille there were twenty hovels clustered round the curious sculptures of the Croix Faubin and the flying buttresses of the Abbey of saint antoine de Champs. Then Popincourt, lost amid wheat-fields. Then La Courtie, a merry village of wine-shops. The hamlet of Saint-Laurent, with its church, whose bell-tower, from afar, seemed to add itself to the pointed towers of the Port Saint-Martin. The Faubourg Saint-Denis, with the vast enclosure of Saint-Ladre. Beyond the Montmartre gate, the Grange Batelier, encircled with white walls. Behind it, with its chalky slopes, Montmartre, which had then almost as many churches as windmills, and which has kept only the windmills, for society no longer demands anything but bread for the body. Lastly, beyond the Louvre, the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, already considerable at that time, could be seen stretching away into the fields, and Petit Proton gleaming green, and the Marché aux Porceaux spreading abroad, in whose centre swelled the horrible apparatus used for boiling counterfeiters. Between La Courtie and Saint Laurent, your eye had already noticed, on the summit of an eminence crouching amid desert plains, a sort of edifice which resembled from a distance a ruined colonnade, mounted upon a basement with its foundation laid bare. This was neither a Parthenon nor a temple of the Olympian Jupiter. It was Mont Fosson. Now, if the enumeration of so many edifices, summary as we have endeavored to make it, has not shattered in the reader's mind the general image of old Paris, as we have constructed it, 
we will recapitulate it in a few words. In the center, the island of the city, resembling as to form an enormous tortoise, and throwing out its bridges with tiles for scales, like legs from beneath its grey shell of roofs. On the left, the monolithic trapezium, firm, dense, bristling, of the university. On the right, the vast semicircle of the town, much more intermixed with gardens and monuments. The three blocks, city, university, and town, marbled with innumerable streets. Across all, the Seine, foster-mother Seine, as says Father de Brule, blocked with islands, bridges, and boats. All about an immense plain, patched with a thousand sorts of cultivated plots, sown with fine villages. On the left, Issy, Van Vray, Vaugirard, Montrouge, Gentilly, with its round tower and its square tower, etc. On the right, twenty others, from Conflans to Ville-l'Evêque. On the horizon, a border of hills arranged in a circle like the rim of the basin. Finally, far away to the east, Vincennes and its seven quadrangular towers. To the south, Bicetra and its pointed turrets. To the north, Saint Denis and its spire. To the west, Saint Cloud and its dungeon keep. Such was the Paris which the ravens, who lived in 1482, beheld from the summits of the towers of Notre Dame. Nevertheless, Voltaire said of this city that, before Louis the Fourteenth, it possessed but four fine monuments, the Dome of the Sorbonne, the Val de Grasse, the modern Louvre, and, I know not what the fourth was, the Luxembourg, perhaps. Fortunately, Voltaire was the author of Candide in spite of this, and in spite of this, he is, among all the men who have followed each other in the long series of humanity, the one who has best possessed the diabolical laugh. Moreover, this proves that one can be a fine genius, and yet understand nothing of an art to which one does not belong. Did not Moliere imagine that he was doing Raphael and Michelangelo a very great honor by calling them those mignards of their age? Let us return to Paris and to the fifteenth century. It was not then merely a handsome city. It was a homogeneous city, an architectural and historical product of the Middle Ages, a chronicle in stone. It was a city formed of two layers only, the Romanesque layer and the Gothic layer, for the Roman layer had disappeared long before, with the exception of the hot baths of Julian, where it still pierced through the thick crust of the Middle Ages. As for the Celtic layer, no specimens were any longer to be found, even when sinking wells. Fifty years later, when the Renaissance began to mingle with this unity which was so severe and yet so varied, the dazzling luxury of its fantasies and systems, its debasements of Roman round arches, Greek columns, and Gothic bases, its sculpture which was so tender and so ideal, its peculiar taste for arabesques and acanthus leaves, its architectural paganism, contemporary with Luther. Paris was, perhaps, still more beautiful, although less harmonious to the eye and to the thought. But this splendid moment lasted only for a short time. The Renaissance was not impartial. It did not content itself with building. It wished to destroy. It is true that it required the room. Thus Gothic Paris was complete only for a moment. Saint-Jacques de la Boucherie had barely been completed when the demolition of the old Louvre was begun. After that, the great city became more disfigured every day. Gothic Paris, beneath which Roman Paris was effaced, was effaced in its turn. But can anyone say what Paris has replaced it? There is the Paris of Catherine de' Medici's at the Tuileries, the Paris of Henri II at the Hôtel de Ville, two edifices still in fine taste. The Paris of Henri IV at the Place Royale, facades of brick with stone corners and slated roofs, tri-colored houses. The Paris of Louis XIII at the Val de Grasse, a crushed and squat architecture with vaults like basket handles and something indescribably pot-bellied in the column and thick-set in the dome. The Paris of Louis the Fourteenth in the Invalidae, 
Grand, rich, gilded, cold. The Paris of Louis the Fifteenth, in Saint-Sulpice, volutes, knots of ribbon, clouds, vermicelli, and chicory leaves, all in stone. The Paris of Louis the Sixteenth, in the Pantheon, St. Peter of Rome, badly copied, the edifice is awkwardly heaped together, which has not amended its lines. The Paris of the Republic, in the School of Medicine, a poor Greek and Roman taste, which resembles the Colosseum or the Parthenon, as the constitution of the year three resembles the laws of Minos. It is called in architecture the Mesidor taste. The Paris of Napoleon and the Place Vendôme. This one is sublime, a column of bronze made of cannons. The Paris of the Restoration at the Bourse, a very white colonnade supporting a very smooth frieze. The whole is square and cost twenty millions. To each of these characteristic monuments there is attached by a similarity of taste, fashion, and attitude a certain number of houses, scattered about in different quarters, and which the eyes of the connoisseur easily distinguishes and furnishes with a date. When one knows how to look, one finds the spirit of a century, and the physiognomy of a king, even in the knocker on a door. The Paris of the present day has, then, no general physiognomy. It is a collection of specimens of many centuries, and the finest have disappeared. The capital grows only in houses, and what houses! At the rate at which Paris is now proceeding, it will renew itself every fifty years. Thus the historical significance of its architecture is being effaced every day. Monuments are becoming rarer and rarer, and one seems to see them gradually engulfed by the flood of houses. Our fathers had a Paris of stone, our sons will have one of plaster. So far as the modern monuments of new Paris are concerned, we would gladly be excused from mentioning them. It is not that we do not admire them as they deserve. The saint jean of Monsieur Soufflot is certainly the finest Savoy cake that has ever been made in stone. The Palace of the Legion of Honor is also a very distinguished bit of pastry. The Dome of the Wheat Market is an English jockey cap on a grand scale. The towers of Saint-Sulpice are two huge clarinets, and the form is as good as any other. The telegraph, contorted and grimacing, forms an admirable accident upon their roofs. St. Roche has a door which, for magnificence, is comparable only to that of St. Thomas d'Aquin. It has also a crucifixion in high relief in a cellar with a sun of gilded wood. These things are fairly marvellous. The lantern of the labyrinth of the Jardin des Plantes is also very ingenious. As for the Palace of the Bourse, which is Greek as to its colonnade, Roman in the round arches of its doors and windows, of the Renaissance by virtue of its flattened vault, it is indubitably a very correct and very pure monument. The proof is that it is crowned with an attic, such as was never seen in Athens, a beautiful, straight line, gracefully broken here and there by stovepipes. Let us add that, if it is according to rule that the architecture of a building should be adapted to its purpose, in such a manner that this purpose shall be immediately apparent from the mere aspect of the building, one cannot be too much amazed at a structure which might be indifferently. The palace of a king, a chamber of communes, a town hall, a college, a writing school, an academy, a warehouse, a courthouse, a museum, a barracks, a sepulchre, a temple, or a theater. However, it is an exchange. An edifice ought to be, moreover, suitable to the climate. This one is evidently constructed expressly for our cold and rainy skies. It has a roof almost as flat as roofs in the east, which involves sweeping the roof in winter when it snows, and, of course, roofs are made to be swept. As for its purpose, of which we just spoke, it fulfills it to a marvel. It is a bourse in France, as it would have been a temple in Greece. It is true that the architect was at a good deal of trouble to conceal the clock-face, which would have destroyed the purity of the fine lines of the façade, but on the other hand we have that colonnade which circles round the edifice, and under which, on days of high religious ceremony, the theories of the stockbrokers and the courtiers of the commerce can be developed so majestically. 
These are very superb structures. Let us add a quantity of fine, amusing, and varied streets, like the Rue de Rivoli, and I do not despair of Paris presenting to the eye, when viewed from a balloon, that richness of line, that opulence of detail, that diversity of aspect, that grandiose something in the simple and unexpected in the beautiful, which characterizes a checkerboard. However admirable as the Paris of today may seem to you, reconstruct the Paris of the fifteenth century, call it up before you in thought. Look at that sky athwart that surprising forest of spires, towers, and belfries, spread out in the center of the city. Tear away at the point of the islands, fold at the arches of the bridges, the Seine, with its broad green and yellow expanses, more variable than the skin of a serpent. Project clearly against an azure horizon the Gothic profile of this ancient Paris. Make its contour float in a winter's mist which clings to its numerous chimneys. Drown it in profound night and watch the odd play of lights and shadows in that somber labyrinth of edifices. Cast upon it a ray of light which shall vaguely outline it, and cause to emerge from the fog the great heads of the towers. Or take that black silhouette again, enliven with shadow the thousand acute angles of the spires and gables, and make it start out more toothed than a shark's jaw against a copper-colored western sky, and then compare. And if you wish to receive of the ancient city an impression with which the modern one can no longer furnish you, climb, on the morning of some grand festival beneath the rising sun of Easter or of Pentecost, climb upon some elevated point whence you command the entire capital, and be present at the awakening of the chimes. Behold, at a signal given from heaven, for it is the sun which gives it, all those churches quiver simultaneously. First come scattered strokes, running from one church to another, as when musicians give warning that they are about to begin. Then, all at once, behold! For it seems at times as though the ear also possessed a sight of its own. Behold, rising from each bell-tower, something like a column of sound, a cloud of harmony. First, the vibration of each bell mounts straight upwards, pure and, so to speak, isolated from the others, into the splendid morning sky. Then, little by little, as they swell, they melt together, mingle, are lost in each other, and amalgamate in a magnificent concert. It is no longer anything but a mass of sonorous vibrations, incessantly sent forth from the numerous belfries, floats, undulates, bounds, whirls over the city, prolongs far beyond the horizon the deafening circle of its oscillations. Nevertheless, this sea of harmony is not chaos. Great and profound as it is, it is not lost in its transparency. You behold the windings of each group of notes which escapes from the belfries. You can follow the dialogue, by turns grave and shrill, of the treble and the bass. You can see the octaves leap from one tower to another. You watch them spring forth, winged, light, and whistling from the silver bell, to fall, broken and limping, from the bell of wood. You admire in their midst the rich gamut which incessantly ascends and reascends the seven bells of Saint Eustache. You see light and rapid notes running across it, executing three or four luminous zigzags, and vanishing like flashes of lightning. Yonder is the Abbey of Saint Martin, a shrill, cracked singer. Here the gruff and gloomy voice of the Bastille. At the other end, the great tower of the Louvre, with its base. The royal chime of the palace scatters on all sides, and without relaxation, resplendent trills, upon which fall, at regular intervals, the heavy strokes from the belfry of Notre Dame, which makes them sparkle like the anvil under the hammer. At intervals, you behold the passage of sounds of all forms which come from the triple peal of Saint Germain des Prés. Then again, from time to time, this mass of sublime noises opens, and gives passage to the beats of the Ave Maria, which bursts forth and sparkles like an aigrette of stars. Below, in the very depths of the concert, 
you confusedly distinguish the interior chanting of the churches, which exhales through the vibrating pores of their vaulted roofs. Assuredly, this is an opera which it is worth the trouble of listening to. Ordinarily, the noise which escapes from Paris by day is the city speaking. By night, it is the city breathing. In this case, it is the city singing. Lend an ear, then, to this concert of bell-towers. Spread over all the murmur of half a million men, the eternal plaint of the river, the infinite breathings of the wind, the grave and distant quartet of the four forests arranged upon the hills, on the horizon like immense stacks of organ-pipes. Extinguish, as in a half-shade, all that is too hoarse and too shrill about the center chime, and say whether you know anything in the world more rich and joyful, more golden, more dazzling, than this tumult of bells and chimes, than this furnace of music, than these ten thousand brazen voices chanting simultaneously in the flutes of stone, three hundred feet high, than this city which is no longer anything but an orchestra, than this symphony which produces the noise of a tempest. End of Book 3, Chapter 2